Hello, graduates. Hello, coaches. Hello, Coach Dummy community. Thank you to celebrate our new graduates today. Congratulations, graduates. Uh, as I think I'm Coach Tony Stubblebine. I'm the founder of Coach Dummy, and I am thrilled to MC this commencement ceremony and to share with all of you how proud I am of our graduates today. Coaches, those of you graduating today have added a tool to your coaching toolbox. Habits create consistency, which creates momentum, which gives your clients the ability to achieve remarkable things. Um, a habit changes a person's self-perception. They see that, yes, change is possible and they start to see their own hidden potential. These are lifelong changes that you're creating. And so I so admire the coaches here today who are committed to building the skills to make this kind of impact in people's lives. Um, we've trained habit coaches now for more than five years before putting together this new habit coach uh, certification. And I think, as you know, the history of this certification it was a merger of some theory and a lot of deep experience. So I think of this as a celebration, not just of the graduates, but also your teacher, Coach Kendra, who developed the bulk of this certification and had worked with more than a thousand habit clients before training all of you. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to just celebrate everyone today and also to welcome our uh, special guest today, Gretchen Rubin, who is the New York Times bestselling author of The Happiness Project, Happier at Home, Better Than Before, The Four Tendencies, Outer Order, Inner Calm, and I think has a very happier with Gretchen Rubin, one of my favorite podcasts. Gretchen is going to join us for an interview. Gretchen, could I welcome you to the stage? Hey, congratulations, graduates. Uh, how exciting. Well done. I'm so happy to be sharing this day with you. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, if we may, I'd like to start by just talking, but start by jumping into the four habit tendencies. This is a framework that we've used in our community and it's been popular in our community for helping coaches and clients talk about the best way to collaborate uh, within a habit coaching relationship. So it's an honor to have you here, the creator of this framework. And I wonder if we could just start by you telling us a little bit about the history of this framework. How well, did you develop um, it? You know, probably like many of the people um, in this conversation, I love asking people about their habits and what makes them happier. And I was having lunch with a friend and I was, you know, I am a happiness bully. So I was quizzing her about her habits. And she said something that hit me like a ton of bricks. She said, I know I'm happier when I exercise. And the weird thing is when I was in high school, I was on the track team and I never missed track practice. So why can't I go running now? And I thought, well, why? You know, it's the same person. It's the same behavior. At one time it was effortless. Now she's really struggling. Why? And I could imagine many explanations for that, but what was really going on? And that, that moment really is what made me decide to figure out um, these deeper patterns in how people um, formed or didn't form habits. Absolutely. So the four tendencies um, divides the world into upholders, questioners, obligers, and rebels. And what it looks at is something that sounds dry, but turns out to be very significant, which is how you respond to expectations. We all face two kinds of expectations, outer expectations, like a work deadline or a request from a friend, and inner expectation, my own desire to start a side hustle, my own desire to write a novel in my free time. So depending on how you respond to outer and inner, that's what makes you an upholder, a questioner, an obliger, or a rebel. So upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. They meet the work deadline. They keep the New Year's resolution without much fuss. They want, to do, they want to know what others expect from them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. So their motto is, discipline is my freedom. Then there are questioners. Questioners question all expectations. They'll do something if they think it makes sense. They resist it. Effective, unjustified. They always need to know 
Why? So if it meets their inner standard, they'll do it, no problem. If it fails their inner standard, they will push back. So their motto is, I'll comply if you convince me why. These are the people who are often told that they ask too many questions. Then there are obligers. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. If you are a coach, these are probably the people who are coming to you, and these are probably the people who will benefit the most because they need outer accountability to meet inner expectations. Like my friend on the track team, when she had a team and a coach expecting her to show up, she had no trouble. When she was trying to go on her own, it was a challenge. And so what an obliger needs is outer accountability. You wanna read more? Join a book group. Um, so their motto is, you can count on me, and I'm counting on you to count on me. And then finally, rebels. Rebels resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. They want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. They can do anything they want to do. They can do anything they choose to do. But if you ask or tell them to do something, they are very likely to resist. And typically, they don't tell themselves what to do. Like, they don't sign up for a 10 a.m. yoga class on Saturday morning because they think, I don't know what I want to, want to do on Saturday morning. And just the idea that somebody's expecting me to show up is going to bug me. So their motto is, you can't make me, and neither can I. Um, obliger is the biggest tendency for both men and women. You either are an obliger or you have many obligers in your life. Um, and rebel is the smallest tendency. It's conspicuous, but it's small. So those are the four I tendencies. I love that you tied it to, to coaching, because I think sometimes coaches are surprised by how well just those daily nudges or those daily check-ins, how powerful they are. So I think, as you said, if you find someone that's an obliger, how did you say, I'm, I'm counting on you to count on me, um, yeah. that just that little check in makes uh, a, a world of, of difference. No, it's, it's a huge difference. And if you want to take a quiz and sort of get an answer, I think most people know what they are. And a lot of the people around them just from the de description, um, there is a quiz at quiz.gretchenrubin.com, which is free and like 3 million people have taken the quiz and it will like spit out an answer. But I think you're so right, because I think people who are not obligers often say things like, you need to make yourself a priority. You need to get clear on your reasons. You need to think about what you want. You need to take time for self-care. You need to make yourself a priority. But for obligers, really, it's that outer accountability. That is the thing that really moves the needle for them. And it's not that hard to create outer accountability. There are many mechanisms for outer accountability. Coaches are amazing at creating outer accountability. There's so many tools that we can use once we realize that that is really what where the issue lies, it's not motivation or self care or self esteem. Um, it's out of it's accountability. I think that's a neat that's a neat insight, and in particular ties in well to the style of coaching um, that 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 we predominantly offer, and that has has benefited so many folks. So the other groups, the upholder groups that have. Um, also internal accountability. What are the types of things that are the best supports for them? Really almost anything works with up upholders. And that's why you sort of get a false positive with any kind of curriculum or approach or tool or app you create. Because for some group of people, just about anything works because that's the kind of person they are. So they often really like having tools. They like to, they love to execute. They love schedules and calendars and to-do lists typically. And so lots of tools will work for them. Um, because they have an aptitude for doing that kind of thing. But what you see with upholders is they can get rigid. It can be very hard for them to stay flexible. It can be hard for them to realize like in this moment, something else is more important. I need to like not go on my daily run um, or like the world isn't gonna fall apart if I, if I have to cancel that 3 p.m. meeting that I scheduled. Um, and sometimes they have tightening, which is where the rules get tighter and tighter on them and they get more and more caught up in kind of their own paperwork. Um, so if you're dealing with an upholder, you wanna remember that it's always in service of your of what you truly want. And sometimes you have to like work on flexibility. I'm an upholder um, and I wish I had a nickel for every time somebody has said that I'm rigid because that's kind of an upholder thing. And questioners, what are the what are the types of ways that we can support questioners others but other than kind of the obvious just be be patient my daughter is a, a questioner so I've had amazing practice at uh, at questioners but what what kinds of things do you recommend? with that group of folks. Well, one thing for coaches who are dealing with questioners to remember is that sometimes questioners can, can make people feel defensive or attacked or kind of undermined because it's like, well, why aren't you listening to me? Why don't you trust my judgment? 
um, because you just keep asking and asking and asking. But typically questioners aren't asking questions like to make you feel like you're on the witness stand or that you're like being, you know, you're, you're, you're being investigated by a journalist. They truly just want to understand why. And the more that they can understand why, the more like the more that inner um, expectation will kick in. So they really want to know why. If you're saying, oh, you should do this for 20 minutes every day. You should do this for 20 minutes every morning. They're going to say, well, why 20 minutes, not 30 minutes? Why in the morning? Why not at night? Why do I do it every day? Maybe I should do it every other day. Like the more you can explain um, the just why you're saying it. And of course, your judgment, your experience is something that can be very persuasive. I've worked with many people and I've seen that this works with many people. That's evidence. That's 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 experience that you have that they don't have. Also, questioners tend to be very interested in like like self-hacking or experiments. So one thing that often works with questioners is to say, well, why don't we try this? I've seen many people have great results with this. You try it. If it works for you, that's great. If, well, that's information that we, we have going forward. And we can think about how to, how to customize this for you. But we need to have some information in order to figure out how to get there. So let's try this. And that will help us start to customize to you, to you because they're like, yeah, that makes sense. I see. We need to information gather. So then they tend to be um, more willing to go on because if they're not convinced, they don't, they don't typically do, do, they won't follow along because they're not convinced that it's a good approach. Excellent. All right. And the last group rebels, I see Cherry in the, in the chat, noting that they're super complicated to coach. They, um, are, are, are there any strategies that you recommend there? Yes, they are very hard to coach um, because they might hire you to sort of help them figure out what to do. But then the minute that you're suggesting that they do something, it can ignite that spirit of resistance. So the thing to always remember with a rebel, and I work with rebels, so I do this myself, is to always to couch it in. These are options. If this appeals to you, if this feels like the kind of thing that's fun for you, if you want to try this. Here's some, you know, it's always like choice options. Here's three things people try. You can figure it out. They often like things that are kind of gamified, like, ooh, put 10, th put 10 things in a jar and pick one and just do that. And if you don't feel like doing that, do something else. Um, things like to-do lists, things like appointments, check-ins. They don't like the feeling of somebody looking over their shoulder. Many rebels have said that they, they quit the Duolingo app specifically because they don't like the auto reminders. Um, they often love a challenge, like, um, so, I mean, it would be manipulative to be like, I don't think you can do this. I mean, you probably wouldn't say that as a coach, but there's this idea of like, that is a really ambitious goal. Wow. I don't think many people could do that. I don't think many people could have 10 clients in six months. I don't know, but man, I've seen you in action and you've blown me away before. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, but it's always your choice, what you want to do. And also the identity, um, for rebels, identity is super important. So I'm a poet. I'm an athlete. I love animals. I'm a responsible citizen. Um, I'm a creator. I'm, I, I love, I, I'm going to create this. And once I've created this, I want to get paid for this. Like, you know, I want to, I want to get recognized for this. Um, it's what you want. It's what you choose. And sometimes what you can do with a rebel is remind them that you are working for them, right? You're not telling them what to do, even if you kind of are telling them what to do, but you're like, I'm here. You have a big vision. You have a big vision. I am here is there something that I want to help you achieve that big vision? That is so exciting. I am here like to throw out ideas, to give you a sounding board. Like I want to help you do what you want. So I'm working for you. Um, the more that they feel like they have an assignment, that's not going to work so well with a rebel, but I would love to know what your, what people's experiences are because I've heard from many people who work with rebels from healthcare to parents, to teachers, to, you know, everybody, and also rebels themselves, because they know they're, they know, they know, they know about this. It's an issue for them because they want to tell themselves what to do, but they can't tell themselves what to do. So they have to work around it as well. Well, in, in looking in the chat, it looks like uh, several of the of the coaches are chiming in on the uh, on the identity. Julie, Julie nailed that. She's clearly pretty familiar with your with your work. So do folks ever change categories over time or, or do we keep a, a, a certain preference for, for most of our lives? Well, I really do believe in the genetic roots of personality. So I think that these are hardwired and we bring them into the world. So we're not one at 20 and one at 40 or one at work and one at home. Um, but of course, with time and experience and wisdom, um, how it comes at, and culture, it will change. So often you might see an obliger who sort of figured out even accountability to build that in 
Um, so it isn't that they were once an obliger and now they're an upholder. It's that they figured out how to work within the strengths of their own tendency to get where they're trying to go. And again, with questioners, a questioner might look almost like a rebel because they keep like resisting everything because they don't understand why. And then with time and experience, they learn how to ask questions in a way that seems a little more constructive to other people. Like, I'm really interested in why you made that decision. Walk me through your walk me through your thinking, because then I think I'll be able to do a better job. It's like that's different from being like, oh, my gosh, why would you make such a stupid decision? Right. It comes out differently because we've learned how to, like, handle ourselves and deal with our tendency and other people more effectively. But still, our tendency is the same as it has been. Awesome. So it's really that as that as that awareness increases, we add yes. to our toolkit of the ability to kind of maximize the strengths of the the mode or perspective that right, we tend we to can have. All get to an aim. I mean, who knows this better than coaches, but we might take very different roads to get to that aim. And so part of it is understanding, like, what is what are the circumstances and the surroundings uh, that help me thrive? And that might be very different from somebody else. An obliger might love to have weekly check-ins. That could be essential. Whereas for a rebel, that could turn them off and make them run the opposite direction. Um, so you're right. It's that awareness that allows you to personalize it. Very cool. Well, excellent insights. I've seen all kinds of, of commentary. It seems like as we're parents, our kids are perhaps our first uh, our first uh, clients or, yeah. or opportunities <laughs> to, to, to practice coaching. Um, so I, I see folks talking about the, um, sort, sort of the, the development in our, um, in our, in our brains and as we develop over time. Um, so, so, you know, your thinking is that we just get, get stronger or we learn to adapt our, um, our strength. I'm trying to integrate the chat yeah. in here. I thought it'd be, it'd be fun um, to ask some of the questions from the, from the group, but what are some ways that we take, you know, what we know about ourselves and then use that to uh, to get to get stronger. Um, any other examples there? I see some folks mentioning um, culture and uh, what are some of the other other ways um, that we use self awareness to to build in strengths for our our tendency. Well, absolutely, because what you see is you know if you don't know your tendency, you might like try a lot of different things that aren't going to be that effective for you because they don't really play to your tendency. You might see something working really well with your sister-in-law or something working really well with like, you know, a celebrity and you think, ooh, I'll try that, but it doesn't really suit you. Um, or you might not understand why you're not moving forward. So a thing that many questioners have is they'll say to me things like, well, I really am committed to eating more healthfully, but I just don't seem to be able to make any progress toward that goal. And what I always say is like, but have you really made up in your own mind what is the best, truest, most efficient, most effective way to eat healthfully? Because my gosh, is there like a lot of conflicting information on that, right? That's not such an easy question to answer. And they, you, they always, always, they're always like, yeah, I really, I don't really know. Because there's like, there's this, there's that, there's this other thing. Uh, I read this one article, but then this other article suggested that's not true. And I, I, and I always say, as a questioner, you have to have absolute clarity about what you believe is the most effective and the most, um, you know, qualified way to move forward, um, because that's what's going to un unleash your inner expectation. So if you're a questioner, then you would say, like, if I'm not moving forward in something, it's probably because in my heart, I haven't really got that clarity. Whereas with an obliger, I might have absolute clarity, but, you know, it doesn't like it's, I feel like nobody else cares. Nobody else notices if I do it. But if I recruit someone else like and I love seeing how obligers come up with outer accountability, they're so ingenious. Um, you know, a business on the children. Um, I have my work just like you have your work, that your teacher gives you. And so every day when you're doing your work, I'll do my work. And hey, kids, if I'm not doing my work, you don't have to do your work. So now her kids are her police, right? Because they're like, ooh, mom's taking the day off, so are we. Um, I heard of an advisor who needed to get out of bed on time and live by himself. And so he changed the alarm on his phone because um, he had a dog that slept next to him by the bed. Um, at, you know, it would go off and it'd be like, Ginger, do you want to go for a walk? Ginger, do you want to go for a walk? And the dog would like, golden retriever, jump on his chest and be like, yes, I am ready for that walk. And he's like, okay, you can't sleep now. So it's just, it's, it's sometimes it takes some ingenuity. And this is why coaches can be so helpful because they know all kinds of tricks and tools and their toolbox is bursting with systems and accountability that per people might not have come up with on their own and they need someone to do it. And often, you know, people will try to get 
spouse to do it. Well, spouses don't make inner good outer accountability. For one thing, it's a lot of work to provide outer accountability. As coaches know, it's a lot of work and energy and, and time. But then also for, for an obliger, a spouse is inner. They're so close to me. You're so close to me. I'm going to ignore you just the way I'm going to ignore me. Um, and so often people who are more outer are, give more outer accountability. And so especially like if you're paying somebody to hold you accountable, well, that's a lot of accountability, right? Like you're going to feel a lot of pressure to meet that person's expectations. And that's just enormously useful. Many people find it useful, but obligers most of all find that useful. Those are some excellent examples. I see in the chat folks talking about how brave some of those those choices were. And, and I think it, it reframes some of what we do in coaching. We may think we're suggesting um, something pretty profound, uh, but but really there, there are far more extreme um, examples out there. So thank you for sharing so many of those. I think it, it helps helps put um, put things in perspective. Well, I see Tony's back on. I've appreciated oh. the opportunity to get to to, to chat with you. I've had a week with, with all kinds of <laughs> unexpected things and they've all turn, turned out better than I, I could have anticipated. So uh, we'll just continue to, to, to go with it. And I see uh, folks commenting. We actually did not plan this this morning, but uh, I will take that we are. Oh, color yes, we are. So uh, it's, it's been, uh, it's been fun. So thank you so much for joining us. I'll let, I'll let Tony um, well, finish up. Well, Christian, I just, I was hoping to get one other perspective from you that Well, I think that, you know, purpose ha makes such a huge difference in, in what we do and in the sense of kind of satisfaction that we take. Um, I mean, one thing that I always remind myself just in this sphere is that I always take my own advice. Um, I never suggest things that I don't do and that I haven't tried because one of my favorite Mark, Twain's, Mark Twain quotes is, um, to do good is noble. Uh, to, do, to tell others to do good is nobler and no trouble. Um, and I, I, I laugh at that because I think a lot of times it's very easy to give advice and it's very easy to get in that, like you hear advice given over and over and over again, and then you forget to be like, well, does, is that really true? Um, is that really true for me? Is that really true for you? Um, I remember one of the, uh, as an upholder, I love to-do lists and charts and calendars and things. And I just, I just thought everybody loved them. And one of the things that was very striking to me as I talked to rebels is that rebels are like, yeah, I can't really use a to-do list. Like maybe if I put like things I could do or like a might could list or um, things I want to do someday, maybe I could do it. And I thought, you know, it's really important to remember that there is no magic one size fits all solution, that we all have to find our own way there. Um, and what is really exciting for me is to think about like, well, how do I understand myself and how I'm how I'm like other people and how I'm different from other people? I'm unique, just like everybody else. Um, and so I think tapping into that of like, you know, understanding myself as a way to understand others um, is enormously energizing and satisfying and, um, and just makes me feel so much more deeply connected to others as well. Because I, I can see, I can, I can be excited by the things we have in common and the things we do differently and, and the things where we see wildly eye to eye and wildly not eye to eye. Um, and that does just increase your sense of connection to other people in the world. Well, Gretchen, I feel like we were so um, blessed to have you today. I really appreciate the time. I, you know, obviously, as Kendra was saying in the chat, they're like the coaches that are watching live were just incredibly um, excited to hear from you, and I think learned a lot. Uh, and so I say thank you, and we appreciate having you. Well, thank you. It's so much fun to be part of your day. And again, congratulations to everyone. This is very exciting. Um, all right. Bye bye. Bye. And so, well, that was an honor. And so is the next part. Uh, the um, next part of our commencement is, uh, in fact, I think the biggest honor of our day. Where we're going to bring Coach Kendra back to the stage to honor each of our graduates today. All right. Thanks so much, Tony. And Thanks, Gretchen. That was extra fun. I didn't uh, I didn't count on. I just love getting to talk to folks um, about habits. So anytime we can we can spend a big chunk of the day talking about uh, talking about habits. It's exciting for me. And this next part um, is is really a lot of fun. I am delighted to introduce 
our newest cohort of the Coach.me Habit Coach Certification Program. These folks have studied their craft of how to apply habit principles in guiding clients. And I tell you, I am um, most proud of how well they've shared their real-time coaching insights so that the entire group um, benefits. It really has been a truly delightful group of folks to get to know. All right, let's recognize these outstanding graduates. Maria Aldry helps thinkers and creators build a second brand journaling. Erin Alessi helps clients develop a practice of focus through the keystone habit of deep work. Patricia Bure supports professional men in their 30s to 50s improve their health and well-being, refining joy and inner peace. Peter Blanken helps founders and leaders develop powerful habits and effective tools to unlock their potential for greater impact and a richer life. Ann Brinkman helps aspiring creatives find focus and meaning by establishing a daily creative practice. Steve Chapel helps people neutralize food cravings to help lower weight. Brian Feely helps clients create meaningful, exciting goals that drive them forward. Kristen Flanagan helps busy moms find joy in taking care of themselves too, guilt-free. Halil Godora helps freelancers, bloggers, and newbie writers to keep confident, inspired, enthusiastic, and consistent. Frederick D. Griffin helps new project managers and busy professionals use mindfulness practices to gain the clarity and focus needed to keep momentum and deliver outstanding results. Liz Guthridge helps quiet individuals become more confident, curious, and courageous at work so they can speak up and create a better workspace. Erno Honink helps clients stay on track through priorities and step-by-step decision-making to create a healthy growth engine. Julie Harris helps the distracted, the stressed, and the overstretched make time for what matters. Taylor Harrison helps clients learn to embrace discomfort to live a bold and meaningful life. Scott Mader is a stewardship coach for those who struggle with the practical and spiritual aspects of time, talent, and treasures. Stephen McDonald helps business owners and community leaders to join the dots, leveraging positive habits to enable transformational change in their businesses and lives. Ashima Nair Verma helps clients create routines to achieve their goals. Guru Prasad Puranik helps clients wake up early and do the things that matter most. Mohammed Shalabi helps emotionally drained people heal their negative emotions 
using unique and amusing tools. Anna Shipilov helps busy people to protect and manage their energy by establishing and optimizing their fundamental habits. Leo Tabibzadegan helps high performers quit consuming alcohol and porn to get the edge in their life, health, relationships, and career. Mijan Sali Tho Baez helps clients build a creative gratitude practice through daily written and visual journaling. Pragna Vinigala helps young working professionals connect with their calling and purpose by connecting with their true selves. Well, congratulations again to our 23 newest certified habit coaches. Um, I'm so proud of each of you. Um, thank you all for joining us today. It has absolutely been my pleasure um, to celebrate the hard work of all of these outstanding coaches. Kendra, should we say that uh, we should click over to the networking area? Yes, I believe we can go to networking and uh, there's some neat features for, uh, for folks to, to introduce themselves. Sometimes it can be a bit, uh, a bit random, so you might get to, uh, to meet new folks. Thank you.